Welcome. This is our mashing and fermentation deep dive. So we're going to start at the beginning. We've got grain. Now, why do we have grain? Because grain is filled with starch. What is starch? A very, 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 very long string of glucose. What is glucose? Sugar. So we want to get at that starch. So what we need to do is grind up that grain. So we have two different types of mills that are popularly used. A hammer mill, which basically just smashes that grain open, or a roller mill, which uses comp compaction and just grinds it and, and really creates a really nice and controls the size of your grist. Whereas with a hammer mill, you can get all different sizes of grist. Now, we use either one of those. Typically, if you're using more than just barley, you would use your hammer mill because it can take corn, wheat, rye, barley, any of those things and grind it right up. Now with your roller mill, you have to adjust it constantly, which is why it's great for a barley. You set the size and you're great. Set it and forget it. Not exactly, but still funny. We grind it up, we have our grist. So basically we've got a flour. We're gonna put that into hot water. Why are we doing that? Because the starch is actually in these really compact little packets. And some of these packets are small, some of these packets are large, but they are very, very, very compact. Now, if you have a lot of small packets of starch, that means it's gonna take more energy for you to actually open those starches up and gelatinize them. That is corn. Corn has a lot of really small packets of starch. So that is why we actually cook corn before we mash it. So we bring that corn up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That starch starts to unwind and turns into gelatin. So we take that corn and then we can add it to our rye, our barley, or our wheat down at 150 degrees where those grains, starches, start to unwind because they're the more of the larger packets. Now, as that starch unwinds, we have enzymes that are inside of that grain as well that start to go to town. Now, these are mostly amylase enzymes, alpha amylase and beta amylase. They go to town and start to break apart all of those little glucose, right? So yeast can only eat small chunks of glucose. It can't eat large ones. As many, it can only eat up to three, that's it. So if it's four glucose together, yeast can't eat it. So we need the amylose to break apart all of those starches. This is called sacrification. So they're going to town in this nice warm bath because enzymes need it to be nice and warm. Now, when we think that we do this for about half an hour to an hour, now as we get to the end of that mashing, we're going to either strain the grain off and keep just that sweet liquid, which is a wort, or we're going to take all of the grain and all of the water, which is our mash, and we're gonna send that to our fermentation tank. Sorry, we are in our mash tun right now, mashing. We send that right over to our fermentation tank. So we fill up this fermentation tank, and what do we add for fermentation? Yeast, absolutely. Now also, since we didn't boil our mash like you do in beer, we still have some some enzymes that are working. So even while we have fermentation, we're still creating even more sugars, which is a great thing for us because yeast loves sugar. Now, yeast is a single-celled uh, microorganism that can produce asexually or sexually. It needs nutrients for growth. It can't just absorb them from the sun like other fungus, right? So we need to make sure that we have enough nutrients to get nutrients from that mashing process that we pull out of that soap, right? Not only do we get sugars, we get nutrients for our yeast. Now it gets in, the yeast gets into this mash. It's full of sugar, it's full of nutrients, and it's in this little lag phase. It gets to know what's going on in there. It's like, I'm not sure. So we don't see much of any activity. Then it realizes there's lots of sugar and lots of energy, lots of nutrients. It can reproduce. So it starts making more and more yeast by a budding. So asexually, it just starts to put little buds come off of, it, off of it. So it's making more and more yeast. There's still oxygen available. There's still amino acids available. There's still sugar. So it starts using all of those things, but it uses them for reproduction. Now, once we start to lose some of those amino acids and we start to lose some of that oxygen, it changes and it says, wait a second, I just wanna make ethanol now. So it starts to eat all those sugars and we go into fermentation phase and those yeasts start to produce ethanol. They're also producing uh, phenols, they're producing acids, they're producing esters, all of these chemicals that actually help create flavor in our whiskey. Now this is when we talk about choosing a proprietary yeast or buying your yeast. If you choose a proprietary yeast, you're going to choose it for very specific flavors that you want to have, but you also have to keep it pure. So typically you'll have to have a lab on site or you work with a lab, uh, a biology lab that will help to make sure that your strain of yeast stays pure. Now, if you are buying yeast, 
you're already dealing with, they already have their labs. So you can get a yeast that you know will produce um, more esters or maybe it's something more neutral so your barrel will show through. But yeast can be a very important flavor choice for your whiskey. So we chose our whisk, we chose our yeast, it's doing its thing, it's making ethanol, making CO2, so you're seeing all those bubbles coming out of the top of that mass. It's making heat, it's getting warm in there. Now the problem is yeast doesn't like ethanol and it doesn't like heat. So as it continues to do this, it gets stressed. As it gets stressed, it starts to produce more byproducts. It starts to produce glycol, it starts to produce different lipids, all of these other things start happening and the yeast start to implode and they start to die. So this takes us to the death phase or post-fermentation phase where you basically see all those bubbles start to stop. Now, this is also a time when you're at risk for bacterial infection, right? So this is when the lactic acids get in there and you'll start to smell things that are kind of like cheesy. Um, your pH in your fermentation goes from five to four down into the low fours into the threes and you know you're in trouble. So hopefully your fermentation doesn't go too far and get too much lactic acid, but sometimes some of those lactic materials can give you some really beautiful flavors. So we typically go about three to five days for fermentation. We don't want it to get over about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll kill your yeast and our pH five to four. Once it starts to go below four, we know we probably have something going on. All right, we went from grain to grist to mash to fermentation. Now we are at about an eight to 10% beer and it is time to distill. Thank you.